excited about this video. I, I asked myself, are you guys ready for a video like this? Are you even ready for what EMDR 2.0 is? Um, it's a fascinating thing and you guys have learned if you've seen any of my videos before what EMDR is, what it does, why it's amazing, and I bet you didn't know that there was a 2.0. So I'm going to tell you what it is. It's basically um, an adapted version of the EMDR protocol. So you know that in standard EMDR, there's this eight phase protocol that we work through. Um, we're looking at the past prong, the present prong and the future prong, and it's very definitive and measurable. And these are the things that we are focusing on and the target and negative core beliefs. EMDR 2.0 is an adapted version of that that creates, in my opinion, even faster processing with very specific things. So similar to my video that I did about EMD, where EMD really, really, really narrows in what it is we're focusing on, EMDR is very broad, EMDR 2.0 is pretty specific and it is based on the theory of the working memory. So I'm gonna nerd out for just a minute and tell you how EMDR 2.0 works, um, how it's different than typical EMDR, and how it is especially effective for those that have treatment resistant, if you wanna call it that, trauma, trauma that even, even EMDR is maybe too overwhelming for, um, how to really reduce the activation around very serious, very activating uh, events, memories, thoughts, and feelings. Okay, you might have heard of these phrases before. Maybe go, going back to high school or maybe some college classes, we have short-term memory and we have long-term memory. And a lot of our memories, even the traumatic ones, can get stored in long-term memory and they can be kind of archived, if you will. Long-term memory uh, is the file in the back that kind of takes us a couple clicks, a couple seconds to be able to retrieve, if that's ever happened to you. If you're trying to think of someone's name and it, you're just sitting there thinking, 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 and then all of a sudden it comes to you. That's because that was stored in your long-term memory. Now, EMDR focuses on the short-term memory, what we call the working memory. In order to really make a lot of progress in the processing of a traumatic memory, we have to bring it down from the long-term memory into the working memory. Different parts of the brain are accessed during this time. How do we do that? Well, talking about it helps really framing and focusing. What is it that you want to work on today? Tell me, tell me the worst part of that. Is there an image or um, a snapshot or an intrusive memory connected to that umbrella of the memory? Once we identify what it is you want to work on, the worst part of that for you, like I said, it could be an image or a, just a, a cross section of that memory, Usually that's activating enough to bring it down into the working memory. Now here's where the magic happens with EMDR 2.0. Once this memory is in our working memory, we now start to feel things, right? We all have this experience. We remember something um, tragic or sad or scary, and we start to feel it in our bodies. It becomes physiological at that point. That's actually how we know that a brain is ready and primed for trauma processing. So a lot of the evidence that has been shown to be true with EMDR 2.0 talks about what is the client's motivation for wanting to get process these events and how can we increase the activation around that? And the third part, which I'm about to get into, which is the most exciting part, is how do we tax that working memory? And I'm gonna, I know you, you're saying, what does that mean? Let's start with the first two. Many clients are scared. They're nervous to start thinking about the things that they try to avoid on a daily basis. We're trying not to think about these things. We're trying not to feel these things. And here we are now in a therapist's office. 
looking at trauma processing and we're asking you to bring it down into the working memory so that we can work on it. We can really begin to detangle it and piece it apart. And that's what EMDR 2.0 does. So we got to be motivated, right? We have to really see the benefits of this. And it's not to re-traumatize. It's not to make you feel uncomfortable for the sake of being uncomfortable and miserable. It's for the sake of the research showing and proving that we have to feel activated around the memory in order for us to desensitize it. And I don't think I've put it quite like that in some of my previous or past videos, um, that activation is really a good thing. That's how we know it's online, we know it's active, and the more we can tax that memory, the better. Motivation number one is how is it activated within that person? Yes, it will be. And that's part of the therapist's job is making sure, okay, I know this is difficult. What are you feeling in your body? What are you noticing? We take readings on that SUDS scale, S-U-D-S, um, which is the activation scale, zero through 10. So zero would be, I feel calm, cool, collected. I don't feel anything. Whereas 10 is, this is the worst I could imagine. And that's something that we, that, that's a scale, that's a rating that we use in all of the EMDRs across the board, right? So we know it's, we know they're motivated. We know they're activated. This is, this is the best part. We have to tax, and I don't mean making someone pay something. We have to tax that memory. So all of the research shows that when you bring a traumatic memory, an upsetting or activating memory into your working memory. It is in a space where it can be malleable. So in the working memory, we actually can break it apart. When it is in the long-term memory, it's crystallized, it's archived, We're not. there's not anything we can do. So having it in this working memory space, we can break it apart. How do we do that? By taxing it. What does that mean? It is impossible for a memory to stay intact while you are distracting it. Okay? If you pull an activating memory down into working memory and you leave it there and you just sit about it, sit or sit around and think about it, it'll stay whole. And when you're done thinking about it, it'll go back into your long term memory as it was. But if you tax it, if you peck at it, if you distract it, it literally cannot stay whole. It becomes pieced apart. And when it becomes pieced apart, it becomes less activating. And in fact, with the completion of EMDR 2.0, those fragments become completely neutralized. At least that's the goal. So now we know we gotta be motivated. Now we know that feeling activated around the event is not bad. In fact, it's required for processing. Now we know the third piece is we have to tax it, and this is how we do it, and this breaks apart the memory. When it goes back into long term, it has changed. It is not the same as it was before. And as you can tell, I'm just really excited about this because um, I've seen it do wonderful things quickly. And like I said before, this is, this is such a good intervention to use for people who um, either can't tolerate thinking about the uh, distressing memory or can't stay in the window of tolerance when processing or there's just no need to go into all of the deep dark channels that could be, could be related to the, the target at hand. So here are some key things that we do when we tax this memory. So there are actually some really cool interventions here that I, that I wanna talk about. One is we use very, very fast and close eye movements. This is what it looks like in the office. I'm in my office, here's my chair, clients are on that side. Typical EMDR, right? You, you watch my hand here, and we go back and forth back and forth, right? Back and forth, back and forth. That's pretty standard. But that might not actually be taxing enough for this memory to break it apart. So we're gonna go really fast. And in fact, we're gonna get closer. 
it's really hard for the brain to keep something close up and going back and forth while thinking about the distressing memory. It's more taxing on the memory. We're breaking it apart. Here's some other ideas. Um, I'll Maybe I'll link below the, um, the developers of EMDR 2.0 if you wanna check them out. Um, another thing we can do is um, add in spoken words. So now we're thinking about the activating memory. We're getting the eye movements close and fast. And I'm gonna ask you to say a word. Maybe I'm gonna ask you to spell a word. I'm gonna ask you to spell um, calendar. So you're thinking of the memory, you're following my fingers and I'm asking you to spell a pretty big word. Do you see how taxing that is? Do you see how distracting that is? Here's the memory and we're just pecking, pecking, pecking. And those two things cannot exist together in the working memory. So what we do is we do a couple short sets back and forth, back and forth, we take a break. We say, take a deep breath. We say, think about that memory right now. What do you get? What's that, what's that suds rating now? It was a nine, where is it now? They give me a number, maybe it's an eight. Okay, notice that, da, 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 da. We go back into the fast, close eye movements. I ask them to spell another word. Spell tractor. You gotta keep things kind of moving and mixed up. Um, other really cool ways of taxing the memory while doing EMDR 2.0 is to imagine my knees are right underneath my hands, like my legs are right underneath my hands, to do a little patterned challenging tap. So this one's cool because if someone doesn't want to keep their eyes open for the hand movements, you close your eyes. You think of that intrusive memory, that activating memory, the target that we're working on. And I want you to go left, left, right, 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 left, 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 right, 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 left. That takes a lot of brain power to be able to think about the memory and to keep that pattern going. You want to tax it more? Left, left, right, 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 left. Think of the memory and spell or and say something so the developers they use the example of TikTok, right so now we're doing left left right 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 left um we're thinking of the activating memory and now we have to do all of that in sequence with saying tick tock tick tock tick tock and we do that for about 10 or so seconds take a break stop tapping open your eyes take a deep breath What's that suds rating now? And what you'll see is that because we're taxing it so hard, that suds level decreases. And it happens pretty fast. And ultimately, it can feel safer on the client side to approach it this way for a couple reasons. One reason is that sometimes we get a little mixed up. We say talk tick, we say we spell tractor wrong, we mess up on the patterned taps, and that can be kind of silly, right? There, there's this moment where it's like, yeah, this is really hard, isn't it? So there's this uh, levity that can come out of it to kind of break, uh, to break the seriousness of it while still in that window of tolerance and still working. And another reason it could just feel safer and more tolerable for the client is that we really are focusing on one thing, that one thing. And I think, I think that's what lends to faster processing in general, is that when you really narrow it down to one memory, the worst part of that memory, give me a, an image or a snapshot of that memory, we're able to get through it faster. And so I've heard feedback from clients that say, this feels great. I, I have been suffering with this for 20 years and in a matter of a session or two it's it's neutralized i can think about it without getting overwhelmed i can think about it without um having a lot of a physiological response like i used to it's not interrupting my day anymore and um i just think that that's really really amazing really amazing and it can afford a lot of people some peace and quiet in their minds and in their lives again
And just in case you're interested, there are many other ways to tax working memory. I think really the possibilities could be almost limitless, right? We want to do no harm. We don't want to scare people. We don't want to throw them too off base. We don't want to overwhelm them. We don't want to get them out of their window of tolerance. But there are lots of creative ideas to tax that working memory in, in more ways than one. So again, some of the developers have come up with ideas of actually having the client stand up, which is like, you don't hear about that too often in a therapist's office. But now we're thinking about the activated memory. We have our eyes either open or closed. And now what we're doing is we have our feet planted on the floor and we step forward to the left, come back to the the V. It's almost like we're making a V. Step forward with this side and come back step forward with this side. So we're making this V shape with our feet, which is technically a form of bilateral stimulation, just like this is, just like this is. Anything left, right is bilateral stimulation. So, so here we are, we're taxing the memory by having the whole body involved in this coordination movement while thinking about the memory and maybe while um, also saying TikTok or another word, or spelling something. So as you can see, we, here's this memory and we're just throwing things at it. Um, another really creative way to do this is by making some intermittent sounds. So maybe you have a click of a pen or like a, I'm trying to think of those, those clicker, I can't think of what it's called. You can make a clicking sound, you could clap your hands really loud. It's unexpected. And it brings this element of like shock and surprise in a safe way. So that's another element to, to tax the memory too is, oh my gosh, I just heard this external sound. I didn't expect that to happen. And now I got to bring it back again. I got to bring it back into the, uh, the memory and really focus on the other ways that we're taxing this as well. It's, a, it's amazing. Um, if you haven't looked at EMDR 2.0, Take a look at it. The research is out there. There's a lot of research validating this. And it's almost like, what do you do after that? If the processing goes by fairly quickly and safely, and now the client is coming in and saying, I don't really feel any activation, is it done? The answer is actually no, it's not done. But we do get to go into some of the more fun phases um, of trauma processing, including the positive cognition, installation phase check my other videos out to see what that is but that's where we really install into the nervous system a positive belief that you have about yourself when you think about this um, target this memory this event that we've been focusing on so we're still carrying out the full phases of EMDR but the desensitization portion of it we're using alternative measures to really get in it break it apart so that when it goes back up into long-term memory, as it does when you leave the office and you've got to return to work or school or whatever, it's fragmented, it's changed, it's morphed, it's different. And every time we do that, it breaks apart more and more. And as we do that, that really translates into neutralizing the activation around that memory. So if you've ever had EMDR 2.0 done to you, I'd love to hear your experience of it in the comments. If you are a EMDR practitioner, I have some of you guys as my followers. Tell me if you've heard of it. Tell me if you've practiced it. And I will link some information below if you'd like some more information on it. It's truly just an even more cool thing than everything else I already talk about. <laughs> so have a wonderful night. Thank you for chiming in and for checking in with your wellness. And I'll see you soon.